feel like Thank you. Good day, everyone. Greetings to all who can join the May CCT Partners Meeting as we continue our focus on low-cost approaches to rescuing species that are susceptible to SCTLD. As before, the goal is to contribute to the preservation of genotypes that represent the unique endemic biodiversity of our region's stony corals. In March, we heard from two partners on how to start a nursery program with coral fragments and using materials that are readily available in the Caribbean. Today, for a special treat, Anastasia Banasak will explain how to discover when species of interest to you release their gametes so that you might efficiently start to propagate coral larvae in future years. Ani is a research professor in UNAM's Corallium program located in Puerto Morelos, Mexico. She has played major roles in the development of low cost techniques of repairing Caribbean reefs with sexually derived coral recruits. And she's trained others and continues to do so, including some of our partners in the necessary protocols. Ani has also developed a biorepository in Mexico for the long-term storage of cryopreserved coral sperm and vitrified coral larvae. So you, if you didn't know already, you understand now how, how fortunate we are to have her talking with us today. She's allowing time for questions at regular intervals during her talk. So I'll ask you to use the chat for greetings only or to post questions for her that you might otherwise forget while she's talking. But to repeat, there will be lots of time for discussion today. So Anya, take it away and welcome. So glad you're here. You, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, you sound good. Okay, perfect. Um, well, hello everybody. Thank you very much for joining. Um, it's really an honor uh, to be invited to give this talk. and. Um, like Judy said, I'm um, very open to um, being in interrupted or um, or write your questions in the chat as we go. Um, and I can also make a copy of this uh, presentation available in PDF form if, if necessary. Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, a lot of this talk is, is based on a webinar that we presented specifically on Diploria labyrinthiformis, the grooved brain coral, um, a couple of years ago um, at the Coral Restoration Consortium's uh, webinar series. At, at the end of this talk, um, I have a slide about resources and you, uh, you can basically see where to find this particular um, uh, video. Uh, there have been, I think, some changes as to where the video is actually available now. I was looking for it this morning, so um, I have the updated information at the end of this uh, talk. So basically, what we're going to cover today is basically six different um, topics. First, just a very brief um, a sort of introduction to coral breeding just to show that it is possible and we'll just talk about the life cycle and about um, a little bit of the our efforts in ex situ um, breeding of corals um, and then we'll talk about what data you should have ahead of time if you want to do if you want to monitor coral spawning in the Caribbean um, and then what to look for we'll give you examples of setting and spawning um, and then when to monitor, um, basically talking about the month, day, and time, and then how to record your observations um, for your own uh, database, and then also how to report your data if you would like to include your data in the spawning um, database for the uh, Caribbean. Okay, so first, uh, the life cycle of Orbicella favulada. This was done by one of my, my students and who is now a technician. Um, here, um, you can see the sperm, um, the very triangular kind of head in the sperm and um, eggs, and they basically get fertilized. We bring the gametes in, they, they uh, spawned as packets of sperm and eggs. 
and we bring them in um, to the laboratory and then we assist in fertilization and take it through um, basically embryonic uh, development and through to the formation of larvae and then the settlement of the sexual recruits in the lab on settlement substrates. And then we grow them up. We um, have an ex situ um, facility where we can grow them up in uh, under natural solar radiation. And then eventually we outplant them into the field. And as Judy already mentioned, one of the focuses of our work is to try to make these as low technology and low cost as possible because we know that resources, uh, we know firsthand that resources are hard to come by. Um, so once we collect the spawn, uh, we then uh, have an, an ex situ facility that's inside one of our labs. And we basically take, um, make sure that we fill every single possible space here. We can actually have been growing, we can actually grow different species at the same time um, because every one of these incubators is independent in terms of um, uh, the water coming in and the water leaving. So because they're independent, we can actually grow different species and have grown up to five different species at the same time. Um, and basically this is where the breeding part, like the, the sort of the first phase happens of uh, through embryonic development through to settlement um, on these, these substrates that you can see here, generally made of cement, sometimes of ceramic. Um, a lot of them have been designed by Sequoia International, but we have also used our, some of our own design as well. Um, and then we will, uh, once they're well settled, we will then transfer these to an aquarium facility that we have very close by that um, it has access to solar radiation, natural solar radiation. And then we, um, because once they have symbionts, you know, these are microalgae that live inside the coral. They need sunlight. So um, you can use artificial lamps, but um, sunlight's a lot cheaper. And so uh, we use it and it's a lot better as well. Uh, they, the corals tend to grow a lot better once they're um, exposed to natural solar radiation. And we grow them up and then um, outplant them onto the reef. And we've been able to outplant onto about 10 either damaged or degraded reefs. Um, throughout the Mexican Caribbean. Okay, so um, the very first step, if you want to monitor uh, spawning, um, is to know what data you should have ahead of time in order to be able to do that. So um, basically, you want to know where your species is or, or what species you're interested in um, and make sure that you can identify it in the field. Um, and so you would want to take photos. I think it would also be wise to tag the colonies if you're going to be following them for spawning. Um, make sure that you have um, the GPS points and maps ahead of time. Um, and especially that you get to, um, to know the area during the daytime and if possible, also do some reconnaissance at night because as you all know, a reef looks very different at night um, than it does during the day. Um, another good thing to know is, is the abundance of the colonies that you're interested in. You really want to try to look for sites where the colonies are relatively close because you don't want to be having to snorkel or move, you know, 500 meters away to see to, between colonies, uh, let's say between two colonies and be moving um, back and forth as you're trying to observe to see if there's uh, spawning going on. So, Try to find areas where your species might be a little more concentrated. Um, and if that's impossible, but you have the ability to move some of the colonies if they're not um, too big, you could create what are called hubs. Um, and of course, that's if it's necessary and if it's allowed, like if it's permitted. Um, but you can try to create hubs to have the species closer together. And that would help them as well, even with natural spawning, um, because that way, if they're closer together, there's more possibility of um, natural fertilization processes. Um, also make sure that the colonies are the right size for reproduction, as, as reproductive size can vary markedly between uh, species. 
preferably looking at healthy colonies. Um, but as we'll show later, even diseased colonies will spawn. And then also just take care of the depth because you, know, you want to make sure that you um, account for the maximum time available for, for spawning, right? If your colonies are very deep, it does complicate things. Um, so here, for example, I show a site that we um, were working on with Diploria labyrinthiformis. Um, it's a site called Jardines, and so we have our colonies tagged, and we have our GPS uh, coordinates, and we have so, a little map so um, the divers can actually take a copy of this map when they do go diving, and then they can um, basically know which colony is spawning if we want to follow spawning um, per, on a per colony basis. Also, because um, most spawning occurs at night, um, you need to make sure that the sites that you pick have safe and easy access, especially um, if the boat rides are longer, um, that you uh, basically don't get into, into problems as you're trying to find your dive site. Um, like I've already mentioned, ensure you do some recon reconnaissance diving prior to spawning and perhaps even mark the site with a buoy. Or if you go out, let's say in the afternoon prior to diving, you may even want to put a flashing light, um, an underwater flashing light so that you can find the sites much more easily. Um, and so, for example, to look at distribution and um, size of your colonies, you can go to the AGRA um, map tool and uh, basically find where particular colonies might be more um, abundant um, or have higher cover. And also um, they might have some health in indices as well. Um, and so, for example, um, for Diploria labyrinthiformis, which is a hermaphroditic broadcast spawner, hermaphroditic meaning um, that they have um, the male and female, um, in the colonies will produce male and female gametes at the same time, and they will pack them into little packets and, um, and liberate them at the, at the same time. Um, and there is no possibility of fertilization between those sperm and eggs, right? So they need to um, come in contact with sperm and eggs from colonies that have uh, different genotypes. Uh, for example, for Diploria labyrinthiformis, that'll occur in July or August, at least in Mexico, in other city uh, sites, as we'll um, look at a little bit later, the dates will be different. Um, but in general, they'll, um, they will spawn nine to 11 days after the full moon. And about um, from minus two to 50 minutes relative to sunset. So MAS is minutes after sunset. And when there's a negative number, it means that it'll, they can start two minutes prior to sunset and go to 50 minutes after sunset. In some other areas, they start even earlier. So um, but this is the only species that we know so far that does uh, spawn or start spawning during the daytime prior to sunset. So, for example, this is what to look for for setting. This is a very um, close up picture um, of, and you can see here the pink colors are the, are the coral eggs, and then the white in sort of inside there is the sperm, it's, uh, the concentrated sperm. And basically what setting is, is the coral preparing for spawning. So they'll bring the packet of eggs and sperm into the mouth and it'll sort of sit there a little while. Sometimes they will, the setting will last a few seconds and sometimes you won't see setting. And sometimes setting can last even up to 40 minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to show this video here so you have a better idea. This is again, um, Diploria labyrinthiformis, the grooved brain coral. Um, and so what you can see now is little um, packets coming into the mouths and um, the four-eyed four butterfly fish is um, a really good indicator that spawning uh, might be occurring. And now you can see this, once the um, packets were set in the mouths then the spawning started pretty quickly.
And of course, the butterfly fish are very interested. This is like a big banquet for them. So they're all very excited. Um, and sometimes what you'll see, you might go out on a particular day and see that there are butterfly fish around. They're sort of hovering around, but they're not really interested. So um, we think that's sort of just a signal that spawning might occur, but not that particular night. It might happen in the next couple of nights. But when you start seeing them getting very excited, that's when spawning is very likely to occur in this species. Okay, so at this point, are there any questions at all? I can ask a few. Okay. To get it started. <clears throat> uh, well, firstly, do those four eyed uh, butterfly fishes uh, exhibit the same behavior when other species are spawning in the Caribbean? Uh, no, not as far as we have seen. Um, this is very particular to Diploria labyrinthiformis. But you do tend to see um, fish getting kind of excited around coral spawning time. Um, but it's usually the fish, you know, that are sort of the nighttime fish because yeah. spawning usually at night. Um, yeah. And you even might see other species spawning as well because um, sometimes... Um, like worms and things will spawn. Um, but yes, there isn't anything as specific that I know uh, so far of butterfly fish and Diploia labyrinthiformis, but you do see fish getting very excited because, of course, once spawning happens, they really get to have, you know, a really good meal, really nice patty meal. <laughs> so I, I remember in the flower garden banks when the spawning was first observed there, that it was the uh, ophiroid brittle stars that got super excited and would crawl all over the surfaces of the orbicella colonies. Yes, and, yeah. anybody um, who can gets out and eats uh, coral spawn, yes. <laughs> and, and I see that Elvira uh, has written in the chat that she saw it with Pseudophoria strigosa. Um, okay. and, and I had been thinking that maybe it was so pronounced with the with the D lab because it spawns when there's still daylight and these would be day active uh, species uh, fishes. Right. But I have another I have another um, question. Looking at your previous slide with the eggs and the sperm so closely in such close um, packing before they during the setting period and before they are released into the water column. It seems amazing to me that you don't get more cell fertilization. It, well, um, I imagine over the years that the the um, non self spawning mechanisms have have evolved to ensure that you get you know really super low rates of self fertilization. It's not really convenient. So, um, and I'm not exactly sure where that barrier is, but I'm assuming that. There has to be uh, like, you know, the, the key of the sperm just doesn't fit the lock of the of the eggs um, when it's exactly the same, the same genotype. Um, but yes, it's and, and even in our trials that we've done, we often run controls and, and especially for the cryopreservation work. And yeah, we just don't get any any self fertilization at all. I know there have been very, very low amounts of self-fertilization sometimes are seen in in some species but it's really very low and often they won't they won't develop very far okay well thank you very much that's okay um and just because you mentioned sort of the pluria strigosa it's interesting that species um doesn't spawn until extremely late at night um after midnight so it's um very different to the diploria labyrinthiformis um, spawning time. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I should have, I should have said, are there any other um, questions? No? Okay. Um, okay, so when to monitor? Um, 
so what you need to know for when to monitor is uh, if you have any local observations, those are the, the absolute very best. Um, and if you don't, if there are prediction calendars, either for all, your area or areas that are close to yours, those are the next best thing. Um, and any prediction calendars for the, for the Caribbean will help, um, especially that there are a number that have been um, published for different parts of the Caribbean, the Southern Caribbean, the Northern Caribbean, and the Eastern Caribbean. So I think from those, you can sort of try to work out when are the most likely dates uh, for spawning. Um, and so what you also need is to know when the full moon is going to happen. Um, if you're lucky enough to watch the, the full moon on Friday and Saturday. Um, and the times of what's called the moon's maximum brilliance. Um, and that is sort of a key um, indicator for us to know exactly when the full moon is. I'll go into this a little bit later. Um, and just always make sure that it's for your region, right? that you're asking for the full moon date and time for your particular area. Also, you need to know the sunset times. Um, for your particular location. Um, okay, so let's see how all this works. So we first look to see what are the possible spawning months. Um, just in terms of general information, we know that spawning generally will occur in the summer months during the warmer period. Um, and that's basically due to the seasonal changes in sea surface temperature seem to be a trigger for many of the spawning events. So most, but not all, uh, coral species will spawn between August and October. Um, although spawning does generally differ slightly among locations. Um, and the month of spawning of even the same species may be different in different regions. So just as an example, uh, Deploria labyrinthiformis in Mexico spawns in July and August, very rarely in September. But in Curacao, it spawns from May to September with a peak in spring, i.e. in May and June, and a smaller one in autumn in August, September. Okay, so um, when to monitor spawning in, or, in your area? You need to select the spawning months, either from previous years in or around your area. And if none are available, you'll need to search the literature or perhaps ask park managers or dive, uh, dive shop um, personnel. If no records are available at all, um, try to go out one month earlier and one month later in, um, in relation to spawning calendars in your area, obviously, when that's possible. Um, so, so what you need to do is find the date of the full moon for the months when you expect spawning. So for example, for Deploria labyrinthiformis in Puerto Morelos, we know that it spawns in July and August, it might in September. Um, so the, the month, the, I mean, sorry, the dates of the full moon are the 3rd of July the, and the 1st and 30th of August, okay? I don't choose a September full moon because it'll be very close to the end of the month. And I really doubt that our Deploria will spawn then. So, um, so I know these are the dates of the actual full moon. And because um, we, this year we get um, dates that are very close to the beginning or to the end of the month, um, it's actually the most difficult type um, type of spawning to predict because if when the moon full moon occurs very early or late spawning activity might be divided between the two months or it might happen in the first of the two months or it might happen in the second of the two months so it's a tough one uh, this year because we do have this possibility of split spawning um, but so basically in my lab, we're gearing up to go out on the 3rd of July. Well, I mean, on dates relative to the 3rd of July, the 1st and 30th of August. Um, 
So basically what will happen is a split spawning will, um, will occur when the full moon happens very early in the month or very late in the month or twice in the same month, which we have um, both, both of those happening uh, this year in 2023. We have, um, so we could have spawning, for example, of a cropper species either early in August and or early in September. So now um, we need to work out when is the um, possible spawning day within those months where we know that, um, uh, uh, well, we already know when the full moon is. So in terms of general information, we know that spawning is in phase with the lunar cycle. We know that corals typically spawn two or three days in a row and between two to nine, nine nights after the full moon. So NAFM is uh, just basically just this, the, the shortening for nights after full moon. So after we've looked for the full moon dates um, and, and times, we need, uh, sorry, we need to find the times of maximum brilliance for our site. Um, we usually try tr several uh, different websites because they do vary sometimes. And so we try to find several that actually coincide and then we go with those. So for example, make sure that you're looking at moon phases for your particular area. In this case, we're looking for Puerto Morelos in the year that you're interested in, 2023, and that it's giving you local time, okay? Um, and so you'll basically find two different pieces of information. One is when is the full moon for each particular month and what is the time of maximum brilliance? Now, in most months, it really doesn't matter because the, the time of maximum brilliance um, happens during the day or in the evening. But sometimes, as you can see here, in, in the September and the November full moon, we get the time of maximum brilliance is very early in the morning before sunrise, okay? Now, the thing is with that, is that even though it says then the 29th of uh, September, very early in the morning, it's actually the night of the 28th, right? So just to sort of show you what I mean here, um, oh, sorry. Oh, what happened to my little drawing? Okay, oh, sorry, I'm, I put it on the wrong slide. But basically, this is um, what we're looking at here. Um, so this is the night of the 28th of September that finishes at midnight. And then the 29th of September, we have the full moon at 4.57 in the morning before uh, sunrise but it's actually the night of the 28th. So when we want to calculate um, when the full moon is, we want to calculate that use the 28th as the zero night, okay? So when the time of maximum brilliance of the full moon occurs before sunrise, we count the day zero from the day before, which would be the 28th of September in this case, right? Okay, so let me just hand back here for a second. Okay, so um, in order to uh, determine the actual day of spawning, we, um, we know that the calendar day of spawning will change every year, but the day relative to the full moon does not, okay? It's really pretty similar. It might vary by a day or two, but it's really pretty similar from year to year relative to the full moon. So again, if there are no records available in your area, make sure to go out a couple of days earlier and um, a couple of days later when possible. So for example, we know that Deploria labyrinthiformis in Mexico spawns nine to 11 days after full moon. We also know the peak is nine to 10 days after full moon. We know that in Curacao, for example, it spawns from the 10th to the 13th night after full moon, and that the peak is 11 to 12 days after full moon. 
Okay, so for example, um, if we go back to our, our example earlier, we know that on the, um, the 3rd of July, there's a full moon. Um, so we then know that the peak of the spawning for Deploria labyrinthiformis would be on the 12th and 13th of July, right? Nine to 10 nights after the full moon night. So we would go out actually from nine to 11 days after full moon and just to look for spawning. And we would actually go out one night prior. We always try to go out one night prior just to um, get people in the water, make sure they know the area in the evening. We'll try to go out in the day and tag colonies and then go out in the evening and um, basically uh, get everybody oriented and make sure people get a good feel for where they need to be working so that on the night when they actually will be spawning, people are feeling comfortable with uh, the area they're working in. Okay. So uh, when to monitor um, spawning in your area, again, I mentioned earlier, normally the full moon will occur after sunrise. It's the biggest probability. Um, but sometimes it will occur before sunrise, right? So we need to take that into account um, in determining the maximum brilliance. Okay. All right. So possible spawning time. Okay. So we've had the month. We know the month. So, for example, 3rd of July will be, in at least in our case, the first time that we should see Deploria labyrinthus um, uh, in the month when De Deploria labyrinthus formis will spawn. Um, and we now know which days to go out. So we said the 3rd of July plus nine to 10 days after, which would be the 12th or 13th of July. But we now need to know what time we should go out, okay? So in terms of general information, spawning time is relative to the time of sunset in your area or minutes after sunset. We also know that sunset does differ per location and time of year. So make sure that you check um, when sunset is for the particular dates that you would be going out. It does vary greatly between species. Um, and sunset times do change depending on date. Um, so it does vary between species. For example, in Deploria labyrinthiformis, um, the, it, it's a, right around sunset time, whereas, for example, um, Soda Deploria strigosa, it's more closer to 10 p.m. and uh, 11 p.m., whereas for Soda Deploria uh, clivosa, it's sometime around 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Right? So it does vary a lot. Also, be aware that spawning could be continuous or it could come in pulses. Uh, sometimes there'll be a, a pulse and then a pause. The pause could be a couple of minutes or it could be longer. And then it, there'll be another pulse and then perhaps another pause and another pulse, okay? So um, like I've mentioned, all but one Caribbean species um, initiates spawning after sunset and it could last um, it could be anywhere from 10 minutes to 120 minutes that the spawning will last. So if no records are available in your area, go out earlier uh, when possible, as long as the dive times permit, because sometimes you want to go out earlier, um, but you know you have to sort of be aware of how much dive time you have, depending on the depth of the uh, species that you're working with, okay? Um, so just as an example, um, Deploria labyrinthiformis in Mexico will spawn 45 to 50 minutes before sunset. We've had that so regular, it's basically a five minute period, um, but an almost an hour before sunset. And that's been pretty consistent um, for, from our records that I think we have about five or six years uh, worth of records and uh, it's been pretty regular in that sense. Whereas in Curacao, it'll spawn from um, two minutes to 50 minutes um, before sunset with a peak of 15 to 45 minutes before sunset. Okay, 
So you just need to make sure, and this is one of the reasons we need to make sure that we also, when we check out the sunset times, that we are checking it out for our specific area, as you can see between Florida Keys and Curacao, uh, there's a difference in the same month by one hour, whereas between May and October, there's also a difference even in the same place. So just, just be aware that you need to check that out. Um, specifically for your area and month and date. Um, so for example, in our particular site um, in July uh, on the 13th, uh, we will have um, uh, we'll have spawning from um, 7:30, I mean sorry, sunset at 7:32 in the evening. Um, and from the 14th to the 16th, the sunset will be at 7:31. One minute, it doesn't make such a um, big amount of differences. We'll probably um, basically take it to, to 7.30. Um, but just know that in later months, the, the sunset times will change. Um, and so we know how many minutes before sunset um, they will be likely to spawn. So we then can work out when is the most likely spawning time, which in this case will be 6.11 to 7.15 um, uh, in, our, in our particular area, okay? So, um, so then after we know approximately when um, before sunset spawning will happen, we also are now incorporating not just the spawning time, but the setting time as well. So if we know our setting time is going to be at a, um, for example, with uh, Deploria labyrinthiformis, we can see setting up to 40 minutes prior to spawning. But usually we, we in our area don't see setting of uh, D labyrinthiformis. In fact, in the video, uh, that I showed, you saw that the, there was basically, I mean, you, you saw it and then it was it basically spawning um, happened. It was just basically the, the packets of eggs and sperm were presented in the mouth and then pretty much almost immediately released. So there's no spawning and uh, no setting, sorry. Um, but in some places they can see setting for up to 40 minutes. And so this is, is also a good indicator because if you go on a dive and you don't, and you know that in your area your species does set and you don't see setting then it's very likely the spawning will not happen so um if say you know your species is going to um, spawn let's say at, at 8 p.m and setting happens for 30 minutes beforehand so if you're planning your dive and by 8 10 8 15 you don't see any uh, setting or spawning you can probably call the dive because it means that that particular night there's not likely to be spawning for that particular species. Um, so calculate the time of spawning and setting relative to sunset. So in this particular case, we know that spawning is going to happen between uh, 6.11 and, and 7.14 hours. And the setting, if it were to occur, would possibly be from um, 5.31. So if we get into the water early, sometimes we'll go to the dive site and not actually dive, just snorkel and see if there's any setting going on. And if we start to see setting um, uh, earlier, then we'll put, put the nets on and um, for when we're going to collect spawning. Um, but if by let's say 6 30 there's no setting and no spawning then we'll call the dive so basically with all of this information then you can plan your dive time so we would be in the water by 7 i mean by 5 30 and um the dive if there's a uh, spawning going on we're probably um finish by uh, 7.15 or 7.30 at the very latest. So I don't know if there's any questions relative to that. I know it's a lot of information. Um, it might sound a little bit complicated, but 
we can certainly help um, work out any issues and it doesn't have to be today if, if you want to work you know look at this at a later time and try to work out for your area and having having trouble we we can we can help you there yeah i have a question sure go ahead uh, this is uh, Simon from Dominica and the Sufria Scotts at Marine Reserve. We're setting up, uh, hopefully this year, we'll, we're starting to try to set a spawning calendar. Mm. Uh, we're starting with D-Lab. Everyone's told us that's the easy one. Yes. <laughs> so my question is, um, if we see, so we'll probably start this month going out approximately, I would say probably nine days after full moon, so around the 14th. Yeah. If we see that there's some spawning events in D Lab, let's say ten days after um, full moon, after full moon, does that mean that in concurrent months, when there also might be spawning, it would also be ten days, or is there variability in the amount of days after full moon? Yeah, there's a bit of variability, um, and so I would. I would try to stick to, you know, the uh, like at least going out nine days beforehand. Okay, my next question is on setting. Yeah. Um, is it so, so it's a little depressing that you said, I was sort of imagining that we would be able to go out and see clues that this event was about to happen and then we could be better prepared. But is it, if we don't see setting, is that going to be standard across all colonies? or are individual colonies, some might do some setting and some might not? Yeah, I think uh, sometimes an individual colony might do setting. Um, and, and I think what I think, um, maybe I'm trying to humanize it a bit, but I, I think sometimes a colony will, will prepare itself thinking that other colonies might be ready to go. Um, because sometimes you'll see setting and then there won't be spawning, they'll actually retract. Um, so I think there are, there are times when a particular colony will show setting, but not all colonies will show it. And then that colony might spawn and, or it might not. It might then retract and wait until the next night. But the good news is if you do see setting, if they don't spawn, then spawning is likely going to happen the very next night. Um, but the indicator for, for D-Lab, I think one of the better indicators is the butterfly fish rather than the, um, rather than the presence of setting, sort of as, a, as an overall global indicator. Okay, so if we're setting a spawning calendar for, for this year, yeah. basically it sounds like we need to go out starting in May, nine days after full moon, yeah. and then once we see spawning we can expect it to potentially happen for the next three days um it'll usually happen for one to two days uh at least in deploria i mean there and you might also get let's for example a trickle um on a particular day and then the next night there'll be a bigger spawning event and then on the third night again a trickle um so, and then in other times you might get two nights of a bigger spawn. Um, it's really quite variable and I don't, we don't yet really understand when it's going to be a big spawn and when not, but, um, but I think, yeah, it, it pretty much it, it's quite variable. You really, really don't know exactly which day, um, in your particular area until you start sort of building a database and getting sort of more familiar with the colonies that are in your area. Great, thank so you. That'll be more helpful. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? If not, I, I have a question for Anya. <laughs> I understand the value of starting with D lab because it spawns in the daytime. And that's obviously a much safer way of learning how to do all this. And it's complicated, so there's a lot to learn. But it's also incredibly variable uh, in terms of uh, variation in months of spawning around the Caribbean and whether or not it sets. And um, 
how many times it sets in a, in a year. Are other species showing this amount of variation or is this sort of one end of the extreme of, of coral spawning behavior? Um, some species do show a bit of variation. I think um, more work, we have more data from more sites for D-Lab than we, so we are seeing a fair bit of variation, but also I think from the work in Curacao, they're, they're thinking there might be some cryptic species going on within D-Lab. So I think that's sort of complicating the issue. Um, so for other species, and I, it's actually a very nice lead into <laughs> the next set of slides. Thank you, Judy. Um, on basically on, on different species that we've been looking at. So for example, for us, Orbicella favulata is one of the most consistent species um, for us in particular. Um, although there hasn't been as much, uh, as many observations of that species throughout the Caribbean. So I'm not sure. It may be, it'll turn out to be more variable once we have more data. Um, but this is sort of one of the beauties of, of if people are going to be going out and can help us with reporting what's going on in their sites, then we can start to try to see if there are if there's a lot of variability or that if there are specific patterns relative to latitude or longitude or yeah, and there's a lot of information that that I think is missing that would be great if people were getting into the water and able to help us with this. Well, we look forward to what you say next. And I just I just avow that was not a planted question. <laughs> Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay. Are there any other questions before we move on? Okay, if not, we can um take them at the end. So um let's go on to looking at um some other hermaphroditic broadcast spawners. Um, this information is from a webinar um, given by Kristen Marhaver and um, a couple of other people. It's available on the CRC, the, the Coral Restoration website um, at the Reef Resilience Network. And I think also now the Coral Restoration Consortium has its own website. So I'm giving that information at the end as to where you could look for this um, particular um, webinar. So uh, basically we have the uh, Orbicella species here. Again, just a reminder, DAFM is days after full moon, uh, whereas MAS is minutes after sunset. So Orbicella franksi tends to, um, tends to spawn five to 10 days after full moon. and um, it will peak at six to eight days after full moon. And basically also we give the times of how many minutes after sunset and uh, the peak uh, spawning time in August, September and October. And uh, similar for Orbicella annularis um, in terms of the uh, days after full moon and minutes after sunset and in which months. And again, for Orbicella uh, favulata, we have the data very similar times. In fact, when we go out, we often collect um, Orbicella favulata and annularis pretty much on the same days. I can't, <laughs> my, um, the configuration is that I can't read what I've got written down. Oh, yes. Okay. So, yes, there's, um, because the full moon is in early uh, September and early October, and again in early November, we have possibly an extended time uh, for this species going into October and possibly November um, for spawning. So there's plenty of opportunities for, for, look, for monitoring spawning in these three species this, this particular year. Okay. Um, and in terms of Pseudodiploria strigosa, as I mentioned, it's um, quite a number of minutes after full moon. That, that negative should not be there, sorry. Um, so for Pseudodiploria strigosa, it goes from five uh, to eight days after full moon with the peak six to eight days. 
um, and 100 to 320 minutes after sunset and a peak of 100 to 200 minutes after sunset. And Colpophilia natans um, from six to 10 days after full moon with peak eight to nine days um, and a little bit earlier in, in the evening when it spawns. And then the Acroporus, um, we have um, the peak um, three to six days after full moon um, for Palmata and two to six days after full moon for Silvercornus. These two are probably the most difficult species to work out when the actual spawning will be because it can range even a couple of days before full moon now. I think last year there was, a, um, I think two days before full moon, um, there was a sign of spawning in Acropora palmata in Curacao. Um, so it's really, really variable um, for this species, especially palmata and um, and quite variable for Cervicornis as well. So different species may spawn on the same night, but at different times, depending on which area you are. Um, and it does definitely complicate the dive operations if there are spawning at, at different times and different sites for, this, for different species, right? So for example, we will go out um, um, and we may, there may be some nights where a copper palmata will overlap with the orbicellas, for example. Um, so that does complicate things a little bit, but we've um, managed to be able to collect, I think, up to three uh, species on any particular night. Um, so this is basically the calendar um, that we have uh, set up um, for uh, July and August for a, a Cropra palmata, for example. Um, we know that there will be um, overlapping spawning with uh, species like Dendrogara cylindris. Unfortunately, in our area, we don't um, have that species anymore. But for example, if a Cropra um, spawns later um, in uh, the month, in particular in August, for example, um, if it spawns uh, later in, in the month, then it will overlap with uh, species like Obicella fabulata. So um, now to the gonochoric um, broadcast spawners. So these are species where the colonies are only male or only female. So this adds another complication because if you do want to uh, look at um, or, or do some assisted fertilization, then you need to be able to capture uh, the sperm and the eggs from different colonies around the same time and uh, to be able to fertilize them. Um, but we have more and more information from work that's been done by Kristen Marhaver as well as Rita Sayaris in, um, in the Dominican Republic. And so we have data for the males where um, two to four nights after full moon, we get the peak um, for males spawning, uh, whereas females um, will spawn two to three nights after full moon. Um, and then we have the times and, and the months where this is most likely to, to happen. And then for um, Monte Astrea uh, cavernosa, male and, and female, um, will spawn six to seven nights after full moon. And with um, Dicocinia stokesi, um, again, these are gonochoric, so you have the separate male and female uh, sexes. They will start on three nights after full moon, but um, we're not exactly sure how long these go for. We don't have very many um, observations for these species, but we do know they start in uh, September and go through to um, November. Uh, and then Meandrina meandrides, this is one of the species particularly that was affected by um, SCTLD. So again, there are male and female uh, colonies and they'll start about four days after full moon in September, October and November. And um, 
we're not sure how long spawning may go for, but it, it could be almost all month from some of the observations um, that we've uh, had recently, not from my lab, but from, from other labs. And Sidrostrea is a species that spawns in September and October. Um, five to six uh, nights after the full moon is the, is the peak and tends to be quite late at night. And then uh, we have Eusmilia fastigiata, um, which uh, spawns five to 10 uh, days after full moon, but there's really very little information about this particular um, species. So then once you um, have, uh, once you're in the process of monitoring spawning, um, I highly recommend that you record your observations, whether you have spawning or not. So if you do go out and don't see spawning, make sure you note the, the, the dates and the times that you are out. Um, and you can use um, the, we have a template for a, an underwater slate. Um, that was produced by Karmabi. Um, and basically, you just sort of note the times um, of spawning, how many colonies uh, you monitored, how many colonies spawned, et cetera. And there are um, templates available for hermaphroditic, hermaphroditic species as well as for gonochoric species. So that would be step one to uh, record whether you have spawning or not. If you see setting but no spawning, also make sure that you um, write down those times as they're really very useful for helping to plan, plan dives in the future. And what we've done is taken that underwater slate and we've made, um, rather than sort of carrying a slate, um, uh, we just sort of take a very small piece of underwater paper. And um, because that way we can, even though you, okay, let's go back a step. If you do um, uh, record your data on a slate template, I would suggest you always take a photograph of that and keep that for your records. Um, what we do just as a backup, we also make um, an underwater, um, using underwater paper, just a slip of paper that we then uh, keep in our records and it's um, filled out with pencil. And um, basically we have these photocopied with the date, the site, the diver names, all the information that we're really interested in. We also make sure to always put what the date of full moon is according to us. Um, and I think it's, it's a very useful piece of data just in case somebody has not calculated the correct uh, night of the full moon. Um, so we basically just make sure that we, we always um, put that information in. We put in our, um, the dive times and <clears throat> how many colonies, if there was setting, um, if there was spawning the, at the beginning and the end, and how many uh, colonies spawned. And in our particular case, how many, um, from how many colonies do we collect uh, gametes? And then the next step would be to then compile your data and observations in um, the coral spawning data template. Um, this is basically an Excel sheet. Um, my suggestion is that if you do use this template that you don't change any of the col columns so that um, if we do get to a point where we can actually directly upload the Excel data sheets to um, to our database, which is, this is a work in progress, um, but basically we would be really interested in having uh, your data in our database. And so the columns need to be exactly the same with no change. Um, but if you just want to have a database for your own institution or organization, that's fine. Um, you can you know, change the, the database sheet however you would want it, um, whatever is most comfortable for you. Um, but I highly recommend that you do that. So we started ours in about 2007. And so we now have you know, 16 or so years of data. And that really makes um, for quite a solid database for us 
for knowing when to when to go out um, for different species. And we actually, and I, I haven't showed this um, particular information here, but we actually know that certain reefs, even, even reefs that are side by side, will ha actually have different, slightly different spawning times or even days. And while you might think, oh, well, that's kind of depressing to have so much variation, but the thing is once you sort of have a database and you start seeing these patterns, it allows you to be more efficient with going out to specific reefs. Um, and so we know, for example, what days we should go out to a particular reef versus a different reef. And so if we need to do crosses between the colonies on those different reefs, we can, we can try to make sure that they are dates when they overlap in their spawning, for example. So it's really very powerful. Um, for you to start setting up your own own database. And I think it's even more powerful if, if you share it with us, but that's up to each organization to decide. Yeah, so basically, yeah, don't change any columns if you do plan um, to add them to the Caribbean-wide database. So are there any questions on this aspect if we start talking about how to report your data to us? Okay, so if there are no questions, um, so basically, um, how? Uh, so the first, the first part of this was was how to record your own observations, and now this is how to report um, to us. So um, again, this this is a work in progress of us um, building this Caribbean wide database. Um, it's an idea that I've had for quite a number of years, but just haven't been able to find the financing to do this. Um, so we're working together with um, Patricia and Judy to try to make this um, happen sooner or, uh, rather than later. Um, and basically uh, what Patricia has um, developed is this coral spawning report form. Um, so it's sort of similar to diadema or SCTLD is basically the same idea. If you monitor spawning and whether you see spawning or not, you can fill out this um, form and um, basically that information would then be um, mapped and um, we can just sort of start to try to see where um, spawning observations are um, throughout the Caribbean. So this is um, what the new Caribbean coral spawning tracker and map um, might look like. So we have um, a report form. And again, I'll be sharing the, the PDF of this presentation, so you'll be able to um, click on that link and get to the report form. Um, but basically, the whole idea is that you can um, say where, where, you know, your site name, um, when you were monitoring, um, what the date of the full moon was, um, what species you observed or did not observe spawning. Um, and for example, if you choose a particular species here, it will then um, drop you down to here where you can say what percentage of colonies spawned, um, depending on which species you, you observed. And you can also upload photos. And this is a really great way for us to be able to, especially with species that might, might be a little difficult to identify just to make sure that um, it's the right species being um, being identified for the spawning observation. Um, so basically, um, from the database that I have currently, these are the areas where spawning has been observed. Um, as you can see, we've got data pretty much from around the Caribbean. There are some areas. Um, I know we also have some data from uh, Belize as well, So um, and from Honduras from last year. So. Um, we are basically slowly but surely adding uh, data to this database and trying to make this map as useful for as many people as possible. Um, so my suggestion would be that if you do want to use the template that we have and share it with us, um, that once you fill it out, um, that you change the name of the data sheet and preferably you would be Carl spawning data the year that you're looking at, the location, 
Um, it could the location could be your country or it could be even an organization name as well as your surname and then send it um, to us along with photos and your logo from your for your organization and that way um, the whole idea is that when we upload your data um, we would have sort of the logo associated with it and um, if there's any citation of the database your organization would be um, cited or your your name would be cited along um, with that. So again, this is all in progress because we do need uh, some funding. Hopefully soon we'll hear about whether we have got some funding to, to move forward with this database. Um, and uh, yeah, basically um, one of the things that then we can start to do uh, with this kind of information is per species, in a given year, we can start to sort of make up these kinds of calendars where we know when the full moon is, we know when spawning is possible, when it's likely or when it's very likely. So the idea is to have, um, I think, sort of going a little bit to what Simon was talking about earlier or asking about earlier of, you know, how variable things are. But I think once we have more and more information for each species and for different areas around the Caribbean, we can start sort of making these much more specific prediction calendars. And hopefully that will help more and more people throughout the Caribbean. So there are available um, resources that you can go to. The Coral Restoration Consortium now has a new website. It's called CRC. Dot world. It used to be the um, Reef, Restor Reef Resilience Network. Um, and the Reef Resilience Network also has some very, very valuable information. Um, but the Lava Propagation Working Group is part of the um, Coral Restoration Consortium. Um, there are mentored courses that is part of the um, Reef, Res Reef Resilience Network. Um, I actually looked on the website today. I couldn't find the previous prediction calendars, um, but I know that if you put in spawning prediction calendar um, in, in Google, it will come up with um, the prediction calendars for different years, uh, including for 2023. I was able to, to get this from the um, Karamabi Research Station. Uh, Fundemar also is going to um, publish their calendar soon. For 2023, we will also be um, publishing ours pretty soon. I'm trying to see if we can do it in Spanish and English. Um, and also, um, there are there is a thesis by Anna Jordan um, that uh, is really useful. She it's um, titled "Patterns in Caribbean Coral Spawning," um, and it's a very useful thesis from uh, the University of North Carolina. And so um, uh, basically, this is how to contact me. If you have any uh, questions at all, um, doesn't matter when, um, just give me, um, send me an email. I'd be more than happy to try to resolve any questions or doubts uh, that you have. Now, if there are any other questions. Well, that's a lot of information, Anya. No, I'm happy to share. So, Anya, I had a question. Oh, go ahead, Judy. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Patricia, and then I'll follow. Um, I had a question, um, Anya. Early on, you were talking about how some of these species are affected by um, sea surface temperature. And yeah. I was wondering if there have been, um, if you've looked at for those years where there has been elevated sea surface temperatures, such as you know uh, years where there's been coral bleaching, have you seen any kind of changes in when the corals spawn? Um, is that something to take into consideration by looking at those sea surface temperature maps that NOAA has in their Coral Bleach Watch pr uh, products? No, we haven't gone into that detail, um, unfortunately. Let me just stop sharing. Yeah, I haven't, uh, we haven't gone into that detail. Um, it's probably a good project for a student to do, <laughs> seeing we have uh, you know, a fair bit of data now. Um, but we do know that when there are quite intense bleaching years that some colonies um, will not spawn uh, to the extent that they might otherwise. 
But for example, the orbicellas will still spawn a lot, even, even if they're looking pale. Um, so yeah, we haven't gone to that detail yet, but it, it, it would be a good thing to look at. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, uh, Patricia, because I'm remembering the very, very early work on bleaching in the Caribbean. The report suggested that the year after corals bleach, they produce fewer gametes seen histologically in, in uh, tissue samples than the, what, would, what would normally be expected and yeah. suggested that reduced sexual reproduction was one of the sort of lingering effects of having bleached. And so you might not just only see it in the year of bleaching, but in at least one more subsequent year. Yeah, and also with disease, it could be another sure another thing as well. Yeah. Well, and but following have... up on your comment on disease is um, something which we probably haven't thought about in the past is when you're looking at the percent of colonies that are um, reproducing. You know, looking at you know how much those colonies are still alive, like how much partial mortality they might have. Um, to see if there's any limiting factors about if the smaller they get, um, maybe the less they can reproduce, but um, not something we really had to think about as much as we have probably need to start thinking about after the outbreak of stony coral tissue loss disease. Yes, absolutely, because as as the disease affects the colony, there's more, I mean, there's less living tissue. Um, and also, I mean, one of the, I guess, um, so the, this is the link with the cryopreservation work that we're doing um, is that, uh, for example, in that map I showed of the, the different Deplorian labyrinthiformis colonies, um, it's, I think, a site that had 11 colonies in total, and nine of those have died, right? So um, due to stony uh, coral tissue loss disease, but fortunately, <clears throat> we do have sperm from all of those colonies in our uh, gene bank. So, I mean, it's very sad news that so many in that patch died, but at least we do have their sperm, you know, cryopreserved. So we can use that at a later date. Mm -hmm. So I have another question, okay. which is, wondering how many species is it reasonable for a small group to decide to try to work out the spawning behavior and, and subsequently become involved in, in larval propagation activities. Like if there are two people, can you maybe handle a total of two species in a season? If there are six people, maybe it might be three or four. You know, what's your general recommendation? Because you've mentioned a lot of corals, and that's obviously beyond the capacity of many of our partners. No. So they're going to have to choose among all the potential possibilities, um, partly reflected, reflected by what is sufficiently available within easy sampling distance, at least at the start, but do you have any overall guidelines for uh, um, reasonable yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting question. I think it's a difficult one to answer because um, it really depends, I think, for every, every site, how accessible it is, how, um, you know, what the logistics are. Um, I, you obviously need at least two people because there'll be diving involved. Um, and I guess it depends on, um, I mean, a lot depends on resources as well as energy levels and, um, and commitment. Um, and I think, so I think you need two, two people minimum. You can start with one species something like Deploria liberantiformis, for example, or something like Orbicella fabulata that when it spawns, it's really amazing to see the spawning event. People get very excited. Um, and so then I think as you start a project like this, um, people start to get really excited and want to either volunteer 
or you know dive companies what might want to come and, and help and be involved um so yeah i think i think the key for me and i'm not really answering your question as to how many people and how many species but i think the key is that you have a particular person who is acting like a catalyst who um, has the energy and brings people together and and gets things moving and even if it's that person plus one and they just start diving and looking at one species and then get some photos out or some posts about it you know people people will get involved and then you can start getting bigger and and going for more species um so i guess to start two people, one species. That's what I would suggest. Don't try to do too much um, because it, it it is energy draining to be working at night with these. So I would, yeah, that, that would be my suggestion. Two, two people, one species and start from there and see how you go. Um, so let me also ask, what comes next? What should people be thinking of doing after this? And is there anything else they need to know this year to get them going? Okay. Um, I think if, so I think the, the, the most important thing to start, which is why we were giving this webinar is to have people monitoring spawning. If when you go out, you uh, see spawning, um, the next step would be to um, look at your logistics and see what you think might be possible in terms of becoming more like assisting with fertilization. The very easiest thing would be to make some uh, nets and we have videos and information on how to make collecting nets for corals. They're specially designed to not damage corals. They're very cheap. They're probably about two or three dollars per collecting net. Um, they're very easy to make. And you could say make five and put them on five different colonies. And if they spawn, then you can collect the spawn and at the at the surface or on the boat you can mix and throw that out onto the ocean and that way i mean that's the easiest thing honestly um and that way you've brought right. five different genotypes together you've incremented the probability of fertilization thousands fold um and you've contributed and it's a nice exercise. I mean, I'm even getting just, you know, <laughs> goosebumps um, just thinking about it. If people throughout the Caribbean are doing this, it's a first step. It's really quite easy. It's very, very cheap. Um, and, you know, we can get people getting involved. Depending on logistics, like, an, you know, a, another way to do for, uh, assistive fertilization and then sort of coral breeding depends on you know, if you have a lab facilities or if you have, you know, a, a trailer that you can convert into a lab like they've done in the Dominican Republic with a lot of success. Um, I think those are steps that we can talk about perhaps in a different webinar or in a meeting if we're ever together. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, the next step is looking at logistics and seeing what's possible. Um, as far as assisting in fertilization and assisted coral breeding. Okay, thank you. Well, we, may, we, may ask you, we may ask you to come back and tell us how to make those nets. Sure, it yeah. Probably it's, wouldn't take us as long as to get the, down the yeah. intricacies of looking for the spawning behavior itself. So we might not impinge on so much upon your time, but. Right. Yeah. No. I mean, it's it's a, that's a really easy um, because we've got we've made videos to show you know all the all the steps and we have photos to show all the steps. So um, it really is quite easy and they're really fabulous nets. They're used throughout the Caribbean. Um, I think 
people are very happy um, with the nets that we use. Um, and also just, I, I guess, sort of the step before that, if people are interested in making their own spawning prediction calendar, write to us and we'll, we'll you know, help you, help you get there. Like try to maybe make your own prediction calendar, you know, even if it's just for one species and then just send and say, hey, I think this will be, you know, when we should be going out and these are the times we should go out. What do you think? And we'll, we'll get back to you. So people who can get out right now could perhaps um, be looking for the D-Lab and planning ahead for something later in the summer. And people who can't get out right now um, can start planning to try and be ready to start later in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I see that Patricia has asked if anyone plans to do observations this year, please add your name and maybe which species. It would be great to follow up af uh, afterwards. And Elvira Alvarado in Colombia has said um, all that they're trying to do this year. And uh, it's quite a lot. But yeah, let's, well, hear from, Elvira let's hear from, from some more from more from let's hear for some more from just the Colombians. Because we know they've started already, but some yeah. of our folks have never, haven't done anything yet. And this will be the first plunge. Right. And yeah, Elvira is a classic example of the catalyst that I was talking about. The person that is moving things along, getting things going. It's really fabulous to see her there. Well, well, I thought, <laughs> when you were getting goosebumps, I was thinking, well, you're an awfully good catalyst yourself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyone else? So Rachel Ayanota says we are planning on doing D-Lab spawning and netting next week. Fabulous. Uh, there we go. Carolina Rojas from Honduras. Spawning observation fertilization for D-Lab. We'll also be validating APAL, ACER, so Acropa palmata, Acropa cervicornis, Colopophilia natans, and so the Deploria strigosa in August and early September. Excellent. Cool. Um, here in Dominica, we are planning on, just moved on me, uh, planning together a spawning calendar, small group, easy access, fabulous. For D-Lab, um, Meandrina meandrides and Colpophilia natans. Um, okay. Um, there was D-Lab spawning in Florida and Bahamas last month. Would it still be worth Tux and Caicos to monitor? Yes. Alessi, uh, definitely keep keep going. Uh, yes, unfortunately, we were a little bit late with this webinar. Um, that D Lab spawning did start last last month, and there was some spawning in a couple of places. Um, but still, keep going because if they were spawning last month, um, and I think they spawned they spawned, but not that much. So it's very likely that this month there'll be some spawning. Um, okay, Lisa, uh, observations only acroperids in Belize. Fantastic. Also doing a liverboard. Oh, I'm so jealous. Liverboard research trip during full moon in August. So hoping to use easy night dive opportunities. Fantastic. Um, D-Lab is expected to have a big spawn on Monday, May 15th. It wasn't considered the big spawn. Yep, exactly. Uh, it wasn't the big spawn, the first one, but uh, I think this month and possibly the next month, there'll be good spawning. In the Keys, we're getting D-Lab next week. Excellent. So there'll be quite a number of people out in the water, especially for D-Lab. So this is really great. Yes. We, so we, oh, Lisa's got Lisa, her hand up. This is a question. Yeah, Lisa. Lisa, you're on yourself. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Hi, hi everybody. Um, we've been having discussions in Belize. We were thinking if there was a way to involve tourism, uh, it would help us do more of the different species uh, observation because in Belize, we don't really have anything other than the acropores and a few others, uh, maybe like annularis. So Anya, you have an opinion on that? I, um, I've spoken to one dive shop I was thinking about reaching out to the liveaboard here as well. We have two liveaboards. Maybe we could talk offline about um, uh, how how maybe we could make that happen because I think for Belize, that's the first thing we need is we don't have the 
the observation times for the other stony coral tissue loss susceptible species. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I, I have two different opinions. I mean, I think one is um, getting, especially local people involved is really fantastic, like the dive shops. Um, and I guess it's, I guess with tourism, I guess my, my, my concern is that, you know, we'd have so many people in the water with so many dive lights and so, so many stimuli. For no, 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 let me stop you right there. Okay. No, <laughs> we don't have many people like Yucatan. So also August is not typically super big. Okay. Also, most dive shops don't do night dives because of the logistics with lights and stuff. So in my mind, I was thinking about targeting a very few in different parts of Belize, like one for Southern Belize, one for maybe San Pedro. And then like the, the liverboards, of course, the easiest ones because they can do night dives, but they only go to two atolls. So it wouldn't be like everybody all over the place doing night dives, especially if it's a pilot program. So yep. given that, can you tell me what your reservations would be then? Uh, I wouldn't have any reservations. I think if you can get people in the water monitoring, um, just, you know, make sure that you prepare them properly for, um, you know, teaching them about how to use dive lights, um, when to shine it on the coral and where to shine it, et cetera, because that, that's, that's a whole other, whole other issue. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely... I, def I think it's a good idea if it means that you'll get more spawning monitoring done and that it doesn't become a business, you know, of taking tourists out to see coral spawning because I'm afraid they would, corals might not react well. So, so Anya, that's an interesting perspective because um, I, I think kind of like, well, I'd back up. I definitely understand your reservations of having a lot of people underwater, but I think the dive community already like knows a lot where spawning is happening um and they like they a lot of places have like dives that are specifically for you know coral spawning especially like here in florida so there's a lot of people going out there which makes me think like you know just like we had um suggestions for you know how to be careful with stony coral tissue loss disease if there needs to be some kind of guidelines for tourist operators saying hey if you're going to go out um and I would imagine Eliza, you could probably talk a lot about this because she works a lot with the dive industry and has a great relationship with them um, about how to do it in a, you know, kind of a careful way. I, I, I think the dive operators here in Florida, they were very, you know, cautious about it and they kind of follow guidelines um, to do things. But it might be something to think about because, you know, a lot of the dive shops are, you know, are looking for those um, spawning dives and they're, you know, doing spawning kind of dive packages that, uh, so something for us to think about, um, for us to kind of find a way to help educate them, but then also find a way to help share that information so that um, everyone can can learn more. Yeah, and, and if we can get their data and be in the database, that would be fantastic as well. And um, Tammy Warren, uh, um, hi Tammy, hope everything's good with you. Um, She's also said um, that in the Cayman Islands, we have been joining a dive company called Ocean Frontiers that goes out every year to see OFAB and OFAN, o and spawn, also Orbicella fabulata and Orbicella annularis spawn. They have a very successful tourism operation for it and are fully booked every year. Two years, um, two years, and we caught one D-Lab spawn way after sunset, which is really interesting, after the September full moon. It would be wonderful to aim for some other species this year if we can get the time in our schedule. Okay, that's really wonderful, um, Tammy. And uh, yeah, I'd love to see your data. <laughs> so um, that shows it can be successful. I think as long as, you know, people, that there are guidelines available, um, Lisa, and I think, I think there, you know, you you know what needs to be done. You know how to give guidelines, and as I mean, not just in terms of um, the spawning corals, but also with SCTLD. And I think as as long as we um, can make sure that those guidelines are follow, followed, it, it can be a sustainable um, activity. So it sounds like there's maybe more variation than information from just a few sites would indicate. And that's probably not too surprising. Um, 
even people are variable in their mating behavior. <laughs> and I and I note that Elvira had said that that um, Pistra, which had um, attracted uh, four eyes, had done so at seven fifteen in the no five fifteen in the evening, in the in the late afternoon. So it wasn't behaving normally when it spawned either. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, this is very exciting. I'm so overjoyed to see all the uh, interest that's been elicited. I hope, you know, people follow up, keep us in the loop. We will try to get that tracking map up, uh, you know, as soon as we can. And uh, we just so look forward to continuing to work with Ania. She's a tremendous resource and is so generous with her time and expertise. So thank you, thank you very much. And before we leave, let me add that, um, I must tell you that when I emailed her several months ago to ask if we could have access to the video of her explaining how to monitor coral gamete release during a virtual class that I know she had taught a couple of years ago during the COVID lockdowns, her response was, no, she'd rather give us an update to include what had been learned since then. So this is brand. This is a brand new talk. Some of this may be material that nobody else has ever heard before. And she took the time to do that for us. And I think we should be really uh, thankful and grateful to her for that. This was really fabulous. And, and adding to that, um, Anya, it's, it's such a positive um, after tracking stony coral tissue loss disease for several years and the diadema die off for the last year, um, having this kind of hope of being able to look, go out and look for coral spawning and all of the great work that you've been doing with larval propagation and other groups in the Caribbean, it um, provides a lot of hope. Um, so that's, that's really good to see. And I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, how everyone can get out in the field this year and, and hopefully with this new perspective of, you know, who's out there and, and who's spawning and what are our next steps. So thank you, Anya. Oh, you're welcome. It's really my pleasure. I mean, in, in my opinion, the more of us who are out there, um, like Elvira or, or Lisa or um, people in, in the Dominican Republic and all, all of you who are already out there and doing things, this is really fantastic. It, it really lifts my spirits to, to see all this information about how, how many people are interested and, and how many people are already doing, doing work out there and have data. It just shows the importance then of getting this database up and going so that we can really share more of this information. This is really fabulous. And thank you all for your interest and for all the work that you do. I think it's absolutely fabulous. All the corals need us. <laughs> yes, well, thank you so much. Thank you all of the uh, people who, who chimed in today and the others who have listened and maybe are getting some inspiration. I do hope from what they've heard uh, from uh, Anya and our colleagues throughout the Caribbean. And uh, we'll see you again in a couple of months, maybe with a follow up to making spawning nets or something like yeah. that. But we'll keep the conversation going. And uh, invite Definitely. you all to join me. <laughs> okay. And thank you for the invitation. Well, our pleasure. Bye.